security meetup and this month's Toy Fun Cafe <coughs> voice meetup. Uh, since I do both, they just work out really conveniently to be joint tonight. Uh, I apologize for the confusion for dates, times, and topics. Um, we found out Sunday that one of that Nir, who was going to present tonight, had to fly to the States yesterday morning for 10 days uh, for a customer session, so we went back to the original topic. Okay, first up, Peerlist, who is the security group behind this, uh, who they are. It's an inf information security experts group designed to allow you to share information and join the discussion about various security topics. We encourage all of you to sign up, tag Peerless uh, Meetup Tel Aviv so you can get updates on it, and just to see what's going on. Um, topics range from everything from security hacks, uh, breaches, Internet of Things, which was our last topic uh, for the Peerless group. Um, tonight it's telecom. They are looking for a lot of community involvement. So some of the things that they are doing is they are doing security books. The first two have been published. Uh, I've got a chapter in the second one, which is a variation of tonight's talk. Um, book three is white hat uh, hacking. Book four is reverse engineering. They are looking for people to agree to write chapters if you are an expert or know something about the topic, or partial chapters if not. Okay. Two groups are sponsoring the uh, Tel Aviv Meetup. One is Greenfield Technologies, who does the Voice on Tap one, uh, where I am from. And we do all sorts of high end technical solutions, cloud based <coughs> and mobile application. Uh, SDKs were providing secure voice across the cloud. Uh, I expect a, a large press release to be coming out later this month as we uh, release our, our beta to the public. Um, BMIO, who unfortunately is not here tonight but was one of the presenters last time, uh, everybody who speaks at these uh, events will get a t-shirt that says Peerless on it. BMIO is contributing the cost of that. And on that topic, I have stickers for anybody who would like the Peerless logo sticker for their uh, computer or whatever. They were kind enough to send me a bunch of those from California. Okay. Okay, um, this topic is <coughs> basics of VoIP security. It will not get very technical. I gave this talk in February at IT Expo in Fort Lauderdale. 90% of the room liked the technical level. One guy in the back goes, I was expecting something more technical. Um, he got a little frustrated because a lot of what I'm going to say, if you are in security, if you know telecom, a lot of this is going to be things that you know. Unfortunately, most people don't, which is why it's being recorded. And hopefully, they, I can be he heard on this. Um, if not, I'll just have to do a voiceover later. Um, so the idea here is to talk about the basics of web security and a little bit about myself. My name is Eric Klein. Uh, I'm VP of Operations, VP Sales, VP Marketing, VP anything that isn't actual development, programming and coding at uh, Greenfield Technologies. Um, we just had our 10 year anniversary two weeks ago. Um, since 2011, I have been presenting voice over IP uh, security topics, starting with Astrakhan in November 2011, which while we were presenting, Somebody in the UK was being hacked for uh, $32,000 over a weekend. And I'll explain that story a little bit later because he actually managed to not have to pay it by a loophole that no longer exists. Okay, so I um, do various blogging about technology on my own website, ericlkline.com. Um, on the Greenfield Tech sites and on Peerless, different topics, different sites. Uh, the security chapter came out at the beginning of February um, in the second cyber book. Uh, you'll see the, the cover of that, and um, I'll tell you how to get a free copy of that later in the presentation. Um, and I'm currently
currently editing my first science fiction novel. Um, I'll be kind. I'm a relatively new grandfather. I will not uh, impose upon you pictures of my grandson. <laughs> Uh, I did that the first year at Astrocon because he was sitting there so cute with the telephone going at all at all. So they got a video clip of him that way. Okay. Um, Greenfield Technologies. We look to give new solutions to technical problems, trying to break the mold that has been going on. So one of the things that you'll be hearing us talk about in the near future is how do you provide cloud voice technologies, how do you provide mobile voice technologies in ways that break the current per device, per call, per model uh, that exists today. I'm not going to get into that. We're supposed to keep this relatively low on commercial content. Okay. Some basics. Telecom fraud and telecom attacks have been going on since mid-1950s. Every couple of years, the same old attacks come back. So there's the story of uh, a gentleman by the name of John Draper, better known as Captain Crunch, who, because somebody found out that the old original Ma Bell trunk lines, if you whistled at the exact 9600 hertz, it would treat you as if you were another switch and allow you to make the call for free just as a pass-through. He found a whistle inside a box of Captain Crunch that hit exactly the right tone. Uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak built uh, war dialers and blue boxes to hack phones just because they wanted to see how. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, first, who's attacking and why? Okay, there are hackers for hire, literally companies that will offer call center or hacking solutions for a price. They will also offer denial of service ser solutions or preventions <clears> they're <throat> equal opportunity. We will we will block your site somebody's site for you, or hey, you don't want your site blocked, pay us fifty dollars and we will prevent it from getting attacked. They don't care, they'll take the cash either way. Okay? It's a low risk, high return uh, type of a crime where more often than not they get away with it. Mostly because people don't report it. Organized crime has started to use telecom fraud instead of drugs and heroin to fund their operations. Okay, a couple of years ago, Al Qaeda <laughs> made two million dollars off of AT&T customers in the Northwest United States using hackers and a call center dialing from Italy and Somalia to hack the phones. Total cost to the Al Qaeda. $4,000. Total return, over $2 million. Okay? This is what's going on. Okay? It used to be a case of kids, Wozniak and uh, guys like this, who would go in and hack for the advantage of having bragging rights. Okay? If you ever saw the movie War Games, the guy who wants to hack the Pentagon wants to hack the computer so he can get first rights and claim to have done it, still a valid model, kids are still doing it, not necessarily young kids. Okay? In some cases, people are being hired to do it thinking that they are doing legitimate business, and it turns out that it's completely fraud. Okay? Who's who is benefiting and how are they detecting this? Um, a little bit over 15 years ago, an organization was created, the CFCA, Communications Fraud Control Association was originally put together by AT&T, MCI, the FBI, British Telecom, as a bunch, as a consortium of telecom companies looking to fight and identify fraud. They found that there was a number of things that they could do, and they started reporting back and forth to figure out how. Okay, Every two years they put out a fraud survey, the next one should be coming out in November of this year. Okay, As of the last fraud survey, in 2015, Telecom fraud was a $38.1 billion industry. Okay? 89% of the operators surveyed said that their losses had increased or stayed the same from the previous year. Okay? <coughs> the top five fraud methods are PBX hacking, IP PBX hacking, subscription fraud, which is only applicable if you're a carrier, dealer fraud the same, subscription fraud the same. But the two top ones, 
okay? These two here are relevant to everybody in this room and to all of the customers that you may work with, okay? Unfortunately, I can't do my normal example, so excuse me one second. This is a IPPBX. Every smartphone has the ability to get calls in, and if the person knows what they're doing or have the right malicious software in it, calls, calls to go automatically out at a long distance rate that you get charged, and it won't even light up the screen. Okay? Malicious software exists to do this. Thank you. Um, and this is ignoring the, the, the concept of people burying things in your refrigerator um, or Internet of Things devices. Okay? So this is... We're talking, we're talking just under $8 billion, uh, $8 billion is hitting PDXs. This is not small change anymore. Okay. Where do the calls go? Okay. Now, depending on, they, they looked at it differently. In Europe, the top destinations were the United Kingdom and Cuba. This was before pre-exit. I have no idea what's going to happen after we exit. Okay? If you look at the rest of the world, and the last one I'm going to do is North America, again, you have Cuba as number two, um, and Latvia. Okay? In the United States, was uh, where I presented this, again, is Cuba and Somalia. Okay? The reasons they are calling these places is you can get a premium rate number in these countries. Okay? In the United States, they're the 1 900 numbers where you do a, a, a revenue share with the telephone company that receives the call, which can range from half a U.S. cent per minute that you get to, in some cases, as much as $18 per call you get. And at six calls a minute across a line where they dial, connect, hang up, dial, connect, hang up, a dollar a minute, adds up very quickly when they do this across a PDX which has multiple trunks. So once they're in, they will hit all of these calls and make as many calls as they can, short duration, because all it is the connect fee that they're taking. They're not taking the whole call. So suddenly you get a thousand calls in an hour of six to 10 seconds each. And each one of them you're paying a dollar for, and they're getting 75 cents of it, okay? The question is, does your business require legitimate traffic to these known destinations? We had a great case here eight years ago where one of the, muni one of the municipal religious uh, authorities got hacked across Yom Kippur. $20,000 worth of calls to the Palestinian Authority on Yom Kippur. No way that was legit. Unfortunately, there are problems with this. Okay. They get easy cash from free phone calls. They turn you into a long distance company for them. We've seen cases where somebody will sign up or hack into a switch and then they will reroute. So they will sell $5 calls, unlimited calls for half an hour for five bucks to somebody who wants to, foreign workers, whoever wants to call long distance, and they will use your switch to do it. They'll pack at the five bucks. You get nailed with 30 or $40 worth of fees. Okay. So this is how they're reselling the service. They will get the service through premium numbers. Okay, the 1-900 as I just described. Okay, and again, sometimes it's bragging rights. Um, you, you hear stories <coughs> about the dark net, deep web, or whatever other name you want. Um, there are people who go out there and brag that they've done this and they can do this. If you want the picture, just say so. I'm going to post this tomorrow. Okay. Um, so, we have a, a case that happened in 2011. I got surprised by being brought up into a panel with Nir, our CEO, because the person who was supposed to be on the panel with him to talk void security uh, had had a illness in the family and had to cancel at the last minute. So we got up and we're standing on there. And the video is still available on YouTube. Okay. What happened was his company had a parent division. The parent division went and put an asterisk PBX in his server room, did not give him the password for it. Somebody hacked that PBX, and over 
two days, ran no, $400,000 $400, worth of fraudulent calls over two days. The only reason it got turned off is his ISP didn't notice it. The tier two ISP above him noticed it and said, wait, this is unusual traffic. We're shutting it off. Find out what's going on. Otherwise, it could have gone on for a week. Okay? If you go out to YouTube and you look at it, you will find, yikes, $400,000 fraud. Okay? Wonderful clip. There's several different stories. Had another case of a vendor, different session in that same Astrocon, got up and explained that we had a case where they provide a PDX. The guy who was responsible at the customer for the servers left the company and they needed to reset the default password. So yeah, how do we reset the default password so we can get in and reconfigure what we have to? So they said, okay, we'll give you the instructions. It required physically touching the box so they know it wasn't a hacker or somebody. They go in and redo it. He decides to log into the PBX and the default password to see what's going on just to make sure there's no problems. In under 10 minutes, it was found and hacked using the default password. These are very common problems. Okay? Um, I hate to say it, I went and reconfigured today a hot uh, box device. They don't like it when you change it from the default admin admin. <laughs> okay? How did they find the PBX? Okay? How did they find out that you have a device that's worth doing? Okay. Before I go, how many of you have Internet of Things or servers connected to the public internet? Okay. How many of you think that you don't because there's a firewall between you and them? Okay. A couple of years ago, just before IPv6 started getting seriously rolled out, somebody went and hacked various routers and modems and devices and put in a little piece of malicious code that said, go and ping everything in this IP range of IPv4. And they went and they pinged every IPv4 address out there and created 50 gigabits of data and published it on the internet complete with a little search engine on how you can go through on every device, what IP it shows, what ports it responds to, whether it responded to standard admin admin or a list of like 20 standard uh, addresses. They published this as a 50 gig data dump. This was the first one. Okay. They used 420,000 clients that they legitimately went in, used the default username and password to install the malicious code, did this, and then cleaned out all other malicious code that was there and reset the routers. Okay? So they used it for a little while, and then they cleaned it after themselves. They were trying to be nice okay? using botnet. And I have the articles where they describe how they did it on Bitbucket. Okay? And what they did was they put out a search engine to go out and search what was there. Slightly out of date, but a lot of it is still accurate. Okay? So be careful what you advertise. The name of your device, the what ports it responds to, how it responds to ping and other things, helps people figure out how they're going to attack. Okay? So, which one should you be more scared of? They can get into port 22 or port 80. Depends on what you're worrying about protecting. Port 80 is your standard internet traffic. Port 22 is your telnet. Okay? There's another tool that is doing effectively the same thing that you can go out to called Shodan HQ. They, search, they claim to be the search engine for the Internet of Things. You can go out to their website, screenshot of it, and at the top, you type in what you want. One of the most popular searches on there is Cisco default password. You go in, you type those three words, and it will give you a list of all of the routers around the world that it found that respond to the Cisco default username and password. Okay. Four years ago, we did a security masterclass at one of the Astrocons, and I gave this exact same slide. Near comes up at two people after me and starts talking about it and says, yeah, Polycom, default password, Polycom. Okay. Comes up with a list of Polycom devices. Before he changes the slide, less than a minute later, I'm in, somebody yelled from the back. They went to the first IP address listed, 
used the default username and password, and was inside somebody's Polycom phone. Okay? How many of you knew that your desk, your IP desk phone has a username and password and is accessible from the public internet? Okay, that's three out of the room. Okay? When I said this at the IT Expo uh, event where we had a hundred people in the room, I had the same three or four people who knew it. And everybody was like, oh shit. <laughs> okay, so first thing when we get to best practices, all of the IP phones in your company have usernames and passwords. You need to change those. You need to update the flash uh, on them to make sure you're running the most recent software because there are software patches that come out, I'll be generous, once a year. Okay, some companies, they come out three, four times a month. Um, okay. So we had somebody, I went and did a quick search looking for a number of SIP devices. 11 million SIP devices in February showed up as responding to port um, 5060 on Shodan. SIP. Hmm? It's a SIP. Uh, yeah. Four. That's what I'm saying. I did a search for, I did a simple search for, for SIP, and this is what came up. Okay. And so you get an IP address, company name that it's connected to. It tells you it's, this is asterisk. This one tells and it will tell you a whole bunch of things. If I know what flavor operating system you're running, CentOS 5, Debian, Red Hat, it will tell you this. If I know that you're running Asterix, FreePBX, FreeSwitch, because I know what version of the software you're running, and I know which version of the operating system, I have a lot easier time figuring out which exploits I'm going to use to get into your system. So be careful how you're advertising. Okay, looked at geographically where they're located. There were six million of them in Germany, a million of them in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so again, asterisk version 1.4.12. Okay, running CentOS. Okay, server is the Apache. Apache has so many patches since 2.2, that there's an exploit that I'm sure everybody in the room could probably do a quick Google search and find an exploit to get in. And if you have access to the more um, dark web uh, clearinghouse shop of tools, they will be happy to sell it to you, if not give it to you for free. That's why they call it Apache Server. No. That's why, they, that's why it should be a patchy server, no, not, not a holy server. That's, that's actually the name. Okay. So why make it easy for them? Seriously, why make it easy? Okay. Sit vicious. Lovely tool designed for a very specific purpose that unfortunately has a nasty side. Okay. It has the ability to go and brute force attack into your IP system. It does port scanning, it does standard library tests, it does brute force attacks against your ports, against your IP addresses, against your phone extensions. Okay? So for example, list all of the SIP devices found in an IP range as part of the SD map. Identifies active extensions on a, PB, on a PBX. You know the extension, you can then try hacking the uh, voicemail. Okay? And almost everybody has it set to four digit voicemail. Okay? Your passwords are only four digits. So if I know the list, I can try. Okay? I've sat in a meeting here in Israel at one of the security companies with Nir, and we're talking to the guys about working together on a project, and picks up the phone and it says, okay, wait, your card says that you've got an 054 number. You're an orange. And this is your, the, the, okay. Near picks up his own phone, dials into the orange voicemail, types in the extension because you, if you're not dialing from your phone, there's an option to dial from a different phone, dials in the extension and types one, two, three, four, and gets a, you have new messages. Okay, there are three default options on these things. All zeros, all ones, all fours. He 
got it right on the first try. Needless to say, these guys were sitting there going, oh, uh, shit. And as soon as the meeting was over, he changed the voicemail password on his phone and called his wife to do the same. Okay? Um, and obviously, for those of you who aren't so lucky at guessing, you have a password cracker based on standard dictionaries uh, of passwords. Okay? Now the real reason we're here. This is how to prevent attacks. Now you know why they're attacking. Now you know how they're finding you. Let's talk about what you can do to prevent it. Okay? There are certain best practices that you need to work with. Okay? Now I'm using the example here of Asterix because this is the one that I work most closely with. And we've done a number of audits of Asterix servers across the world and found all sorts of really scary problems. Okay? Went and scanned 17 different Asterix servers in four different companies around the world and found Apache had a shitload of critical, urgent patches that had not been installed. Versions of CentOS that have passed from end of life to end of security life to, oh God, what the heck are you doing with this stuff? It was discontinued ages ago. I still know people who are running Asterix 1.2, which they stopped doing support for more than a decade ago. This is like people who are still running uh, XP for their uh, automatic uh, cash machines. Okay? So there are a bunch of best practices that you should be paying attention to. Okay? Some of these are policy. So let's start talking about, as a company, what should you be doing? Okay? You need to make sure that you have um, in all sorts of password policies. Okay? Do you have password policies that they cannot use the extension as the password for the voicemail box? Which phones need a voice mailbox? Okay. How many of you work in a company that has a phone in the lobby or in the break room? Yeah, three or four. Okay. Is there any reason why the lobby phone has a voice mailbox? Who's going to take the call? Who's supposed to be calling into that phone? Once you've captured the voicemail and you've hacked into that, you can set it up to do call redirect, call forwarding. So there was a big thing in the 90s where people would call into a company and say, I'm calling from the IT department, I'm calling from the telephone company, I need to test the line, can you press 9-1 uh, just so I can see if the line works. At that particular point, 90% of the time that you press 9-1, you gave them an open outside line that they could then dial and they could call anywhere they wanted. This was one of the early phishing attacks. Okay? You need to make sure the voicemail box enables the same functionality because the voicemail acts as if it's an inside extension. <coughs> so yes, you don't allow somebody coming from the outside to make outside calls, but if they're in the voicemail, the voicemail can. Okay? So you need to check that your PBXs and all of your servers have good, strong passwords. I've seen one company where it had nine PBXs all of them had the same password. Convenient for the hacker. Okay? When the answer is root one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So make sure you have different passwords for different servers. Make sure you have different passwords for different levels of access. You will have root access that is needed rarely, and you'll have certain other functions using asterisks, for example, to get into the um, call portal, okay? You will have a flash operator panel. You need to give certain server level or PBX level authorization to the team leader for your call center. You don't want them to have the same level of access as your IT guy who's going to be configuring the phone. They should only be able to get limited access. So you need to pay attention to what you're giving, who you're giving it to, and how much you're giving them standard policies that should be going across the board for everything in the company, okay? Remember again, I said phones and extensions have their own uh, passwords, uh, change them. Try not to make them sequential, try not to make them the same as the extension. And if you can get away with it, don't make your extension sequential or only three digits. 
four digits is slightly better extensions, but it's still not perfect. Okay? You need to have an update policy. When do you update the software on the actual phones? When do you update the software on the server? When do you up update the operating system? How often do you do backups? Okay? Again, mailboxes. Who needs a mailbox? Who doesn't? The receptionist does not need a voice mailbox. The phone in the lobby, the phone in the kitchen, the phone in the server room do not need voicemail. Okay? Um, and you should do something to do real-time or near real-time monitoring of the phone usage. Our suddenly calls, you have a steady bill of 10,000 shekels every month, and then suddenly you have 10,000 shekels in one day. You'll only find out about that at the end of the month when you get your invoice. You should have some sort of monitoring software, some sort of view into what's going on in semi-real time. Preferably real time, but most people don't need it. Um, it's usually done at the end of calls, so you need to pay attention to that. Okay? Again, do you need the courtesy phone? Do you even need the phone in the lobby these days? Everybody's walking around with the cell phone, so if they need to call somebody and say, come on down, I'm in the lobby, you don't really need to have the, the phone there. Or the delivery guy needs to call back to headquarters. He doesn't need to call from your phone. He can use the cell phone. 20 years ago, when nobody had cell phones, it was necessary. Today, why? Mostly it's so the cleaning lady can call back home, whichever country she comes from. Okay? Do you need to have the services to allow international calling? Does every extension need to make international calls? Do they need to make them 24 hours? Okay? I've got an outbound knock. I need to give, have 24 hours, and I need to allow calls to emergency services, 100, 101, 102. No problem. Does anybody else need to make those calls between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m.? Limit the calls as much as you can. Limit your exposure because this will make it more difficult for people to hack in and change things. Okay. Harden your system. Set up policies for who needs it, why it happens. Again, lock things down. Don't allow pass-through calls. Okay. There was, used to be a very big thing where you could dial in an extension and it would call you back. Reasonably safe, especially if it had a password on it. So I dial into my extension while I work at Alvarian. I dial a special code number. It would dial back specifically to my cell phone. Then I would type in a code, and then I would be allowed to make calls to the outside world, saving the company money instead of making long-distance calls, because it's done dial back. Less useful today, but it was at least a two-factor authentication. It only came to a particular number, and I had to put in the password to be able to authenticate. Most people don't bother the second one. So the phone number can be spoofed, and somebody can then be making calls to anywhere, and you never know who did it. Um, again, use monitoring and auditing, multi-layer security. Firewalls are good. SIP firewalls are good. Be careful which firewalls you're sticking on your SIP services, because some of them don't play nice with SIP. Finished. Hmm? Finished at the restart. Okay. Um, Longer passwords are better. Pass phrases are better. Okay? If you are able to use some sort of a password management system, this is good because you have to remember one very important thing. Human resources change. So somebody other than the IT manager needs to know that the, the password to the server. One or two people have to have it because he gets sick, he goes on vacation, he leaves the company. Somebody else has to have access without having to re redo the default password and reset everything from scratch. Okay? Check out your liabilities on your contracts. Now, the story I was explaining before. Nova uh, early November, uh, end of October, actually, October 27, 2011, cabinet company in the UK was hacked for £20,000 worth of calls. Their phone company came to them and said, you got, the calls came from your PBX, you're responsible for the calls. They said, no. Our contract says that we are required to do all reasonable activities. We did that. They got a judge to agree. They did all of the reasonable, they had the security, they had the password, they had the firewall, everything that was specified as normal, reasonable, they had covered. They got off the hook, the phone company had to eat it. It's one of two cases I've heard where the phone company had to eat it. Okay. So always look at what your contract says and what is going on with it, okay? If they offer some sort of fraud protection, some sort of 
call blocking, some sort of call limit, use it. There are certain services, certain functions that are available. Take advantage of them because otherwise you're leaving yourself open and your pockets and money just going out the door. Second case, which I think I may add in here later, um, keep track of logs and monitors and, and keep track of them and store them. There was a company out of Atlanta that got hit with three, normal phone bill was 20,000 US dollars every month. One, two Junes ago, they got a bill from Comcast, $320,000. And Comcast says they pay. And the guy turns around and says, here are six months of logs. Here are six months of CBRs, six months of router logs, six months of everything. Show me one of the calls that you are charging me for shows up in any of the logs or you have anything. They're like, they're calls from you. And like, none of them came from my PBX. None of them came into my site. Eventually, they found out that somebody was spoofing him one level up, and was that was where the, char the charges were coming from. And Comcast never admits they're wrong. But come August, the charge was removed from his bill. He was credited back to 300000 Okay, Keep the logs, keep track of the data, because it is the only thing that you have that will protect your business if you have to go to court or you have to fight these things. The phone company is not looking out for your best interest. They've got their own stockholders to worry about. Comcast was not happy having the $300,000 worth of fraudulent calls. Uh, and nobody would have known about it except this guy mentioned it at one of the Astrocots. Okay, Block premium numbers unless you absolutely need them. Block international call. Israel is a little more difficult. Here, most calls, most companies have a need to make some international calls. Okay? Very rarely does anybody in Israel have to call Afghanistan. Okay? Very rarely do you need to make certain calls. A lot of businesses we found in the States, locksmiths, whose entire business is done in a 25 kilometer radius around their location, every call that they make legit is within that 25 kilometer radius. We're getting hit with calls to Afghanistan and Cuba. Lock it down. If you don't need international calls, block it. Even if you have to one one off authorize them, do so. It saves you a ton of money for the a little amount of grief. Okay? Looking at the operating system. Okay? So look at uh, unenforced password policy. Make sure that they're going on. Make sure people are doing it. Make sure people change their passwords. Make sure they're not sticking them under their keyboards, under their phones, whatever else. These things are common sense. Okay? I used to use the, the scene from Spaceballs, okay, where the king is finally convinced to give up the code to the air shield. And he goes, one, two, three, four. And Rick Moranis' character, Dark Helmet, flips up the helmet and goes, what? That's the color that an idiot would use on their luggage. And walks his president and goes, wow, that's the code I use on my luggage. Okay? I'll make it easy. Don't let them use short sequential numbers. Don't let them use things of that nature. Try not to let them use passwords that are dictionary words, and we'll get to that for in a second. Okay, again, update the servers, update Apache, um, make sure you have different passwords for different activities. Okay, so for example, I went and I looked, like I said, 17 different um, servers. We looked at just the average server had 18.6 critical um, patches that were needed, critical uh, security faults, okay? The largest one had 117. One server, 117 critical errors were found when we did uh, the security audit, okay? You need to have an update policy. That one, the 117, was still running CentOS 4. They hadn't updated Apache from the day it was installed 10 years earlier. Everything was, you've got to be kidding me, this is ancient. Okay? So, for example, we found some of the high things. Okay? Apache HTTP, D, web service, range header, denial of service, underflow vulnerabilities, CentOS update kernel. Okay? All of these fixes were done, in, in this case, it was CentOS. Literally, the, exam, the whole thing was done using the yum update command. Admittedly, it took... 10,000 updates to run, which ran for about two hours, but everything was updated by then. Have a policy so you do it at least once in a while. Okay. 
Now looking at the actual PBX, okay? Look for the common attacks. Hide the name. Change the context of the calls from internal, from external, who has what rights. Set up slightly more complicated rules to limit the functionality to who needs it, okay? Um, again, with older PBXs, the extension SIP trunks are still configured even though they are not used. Okay? How many of you have had a SIP provider that you used and then stopped using it but never actually went and then bothered to delete the details about it? Or old extensions that you disabled but didn't delete the extension? You won't get a smack. Um, okay? Check that the voice and data configurations are all done in nice flat files, make sure that they're all at the same level. Try and do this to make sure everything is done properly and clean. Um, pay attention to the fact that asterisk, free switch, all of these come with default configurations to some of the more common SIP providers of eight or nine years ago. It's still hard coded into the files. Okay? Test things and check things like SIP vicious for enumeration attacks. You can block these, okay? You go into your asterisk PBX and use the always authenticate reject, okay? And you can block some of these simple configuration requirements, okay? So I'll give the example. How many of you are using asterisks in the room? You don't count. Okay, so how many of you are using free PBX? Okay, not everybody realizes it's the same thing. That's why I asked that. Uh, Elastics, which is no longer Asterix or Free PBX. Um, they're using a whole different system since the beginning of January. Um, free switch, not very common in Israel. Okay, so this is the this is what you do in Asterix. You go into the SIP comp, you configure it here. Free PBX, you can go in and to do it on the SIP configuration page. Okay. Don't be on a public internet without some sort of protection. Okay? There are session border controllers, SIP firewalls, NAT, things that you can do to protect it. Yes, you need to have a point-to-point -point SIP authentication to your SIP provider and to each individual device. But it shouldn't be open to everybody. Okay? Don't keep the default passwords on the server. Use things like fail to ban to block repeated attempts. Okay, when we're done, I will show you. I actually sat and watched somebody trying to attack the management port on Asterix while I was watching it. And you can see it's going through and hitting the various management names and uses a, a simple directory, okay, a simple dictionary of known words that they try to use to attack. Um, and I'll go into that in a second. Okay, change the name of your PBX. Don't say so and so PBX, give it a name that is. Uh, less tempting. Okay. Lots of people love putting out Wi-Fi SSIDs that say hack me or uh, IRS or, or, or other sorts of things to try and intimidate people. Other people just see this as a challenge. Don't make it easy. Okay? Again, use the proper context. Okay? Our calls that are on going out in the trunk, internal, external, pay attention with the privileges based on the direction and who's making the call, okay? Use a lot of them, they're free, okay? So for example, I give an example, from SIP provider, from the IAX2 line, from a sales employee, from a courtesy phone, okay? When you have the extension, you can then assign it to different contacts where salespeople are allowed to make international calls. Courtesy phone isn't. And you can set up different contacts and different rules, okay? Okay? The difference between a lowercase t and an uppercase t on allowing who can transfer the call to an outside line is very important. Okay? And these are the default settings. And they give you both of them in free PBX. Okay? At which point, the caller who's making the call, who, who called into your PBX, can dial a code and can sometimes trigger a transfer. In the middle of a call, they can transfer out to an outside line versus the person inside who's transferring it to another extension. So you need to pay attention to these. Okay? Physical level. Obvious question. Who has access to your physical server room? 
who actually can touch the phones, okay? And specifically, who can touch the phones during nights, weekends, etc., when nobody else is watching, okay? Most of the fraud that we have seen is in the twenty to $25,000 category, happens over two days, tends to happen over nights and holidays, when nobody else is in the office. And it's not all inside attacks. This is when it's convenient to hack it because suddenly every trunk on the PBX is available to take. So I hack it and I can make call after call after call using the computer. Okay? This is unrelated to the question of people who are using telephones to call into call centers and trying to spoof who you are so they can get your bank to send them money or your credit card company to authorize a transaction. That's a completely separate topic in discussion and I'm hoping somebody will volunteer to give that part of the talk because uh, I really hate being the only one giving these talks. Yes? If they're going through the trouble of hacking, isn't there, aren't the recordings much more valuable? Aren't the recordings? The recordings much more valuable. Because if you're going through all that trouble, I'd go no. with the recordings. Why would you take the recordings when you can get for, uh, straight cash directly uh, PayPal into your, or wired into your bank account with no uh, effort? If you hack an insurance company or something like that, you get all the credit card information. It's harder to utilize credit cards to gain cash than yeah. just making phone calls to bring the distinctions. Uh, okay. The, 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 it's two factors. One, having the credit card information, even if you get the credit, even if you could get the credit card number, proper name, credit card number, uh, and the code on the back, expiration date, it's difficult to use. Lots of places you still can, internet and things and stuff like that. It's easier to trace because that's where the money is going to or where whatever you're purchasing is going to. Wire transfers go into an account, that's easier to trace than going through multiple layers through a phone company that's reluctant to give its customers information away, number one. And number two, in theory, they're supposed to not be recording the credit card information as part of the recording. In the UK, that is a, manda a mandated requirement. In the EU, it's supposed to be, actually it's supposed to be mandated as of the beginning of April this year. That they are in the supposed UK? To, in the EU. Okay. They're, supposed to, they're supposed to be blocking and they're supposed to find ways to not record that number because they don't want to have it available for people to hack. But if you've got a PBX that you can hack it in an hour and get $10,000 with almost no risk. They're basically looking to get away with the loot. <laughs> Don't wanna, uh, it's quick, it's fast, and it's relatively low risk because it's going through multiple companies, multiple countries. Okay. There have been a lot of cases recently of uh, Taiwanese or Chinese or Philippine uh, individuals getting arrested uh, for call centers who are doing this kind of attack or trying to do the, the phishing attacks. Um, it's very popular, it's very low cost, it's relatively low tech. Thanks. Okay. Pay attention to current events. Okay, this was relevant um, two years ago, um, and I'm not sure it's still relevant. We're still waiting to see how the Trump um, statements come up. Okay, two years ago, the European Union canceled the sharing of data between the European Union and non-European countries because Snowden leaked out the fact that they were able to be hacked by the NSA. And suddenly the whole safe harbor rules got thrown out the window and they had to negotiate a new set of rules which went into effect last August. In the first Donald Trump presidential decree that we're not going to let in people from seven countries included in clause number 14, agencies to the extent consistent with applicable law will assure that their privacy excludes persons who are not United States citizens or lawful permanent residents. Okay. The way it is written says Google in Europe is not allowed to give data back to Google in the United States because the people in Europe are not United States citizens and that runs afoul of the European privacy laws. The same hold true for telephone calls. A call detail record of who called, who they called to, when they called and how long the call has personally identifiable information and it wasn't allowed to be shared between Europe and the United States if this particular clause was interpreted as the full, as exactly what's written instead of what Trump said, no, no, that's not what we meant. That one was put on hold. I've got no idea what's going to happen. We're still waiting. 
you have to pay attention to these rules. Um, in a lot of places, voice over IP uh, services come with internet providers and don't come with traditional telephones. A traditional POTS telephone from Bezic or from any other carrier is powered by the switch. The electricity comes from the switch. So if you have a power outage in your house, you're still able to call an ambulance. If you are connected to a cable modem, a internet modem, or other uh, internet device, unless you have a battery on that device, you suddenly have no connectivity to the outside world, you can't make an emergency call. So last year, the United States mandated that, people, that the companies providing these services have to make available to the, for the customer to pay for a UPS, a two hour to four hour battery that the customer has to pay for to install. Not that they have to install like it used to, but pay attention to these rules because they keep changing and they're not very well documented frequently. You have to do a lot of digging and looking through the news to see how it works. Okay, shameless plug. As I mentioned, Essentials of Cyber Security is the Peerless book number two. Uh, this talk is based on chapter number nine, uh, Telecom uh, 101. If you go out to uh, Tiny CC Cybersecurity, you will get to a page on Peerless. At the bottom, it gives you two options. You can pay 99 cents and download the book from Amazon, or if you scroll down three more lines, it will tell you how you can download it for free. Amazon would not let them put it up for free at that point. It may be by now, but I don't think so. Okay, but you have to log in. Please sign up to Peerless. Please come to more Voice on Taps, more Peerless meetups. We will continue to do that separate. And if you have a topic that you are reasonably comfortable talking about or presenting, preferably in English, not mandatory, but preferably, please let me know. We are looking for other speakers to get up and present in monthly meetups. We're going to continue trying to hold them here in Google rather than up in our offices in Netanya. But for the peerless ones, we are looking for other people to present. We had two, talk, two speakers at the first one. Could not come up with anybody else, so I'm doing it for this one. We'd like to make this a monthly event if we can get more speakers. Okay? Yes, I'm looking at you. Um, so if you have a topic, if you feel comfortable talking about questions, question and answer sessions, any topic related to security, IoT, telecom, uh, internet, uh, call centers, whatever topic related to security, firewalls, antivirus, all of this, fair game for a presentation. It can be a half an hour, it can be an hour long talk, whatever works most comfortably for you. Okay? If you have questions, you can catch me at eric uh, at greenfieldtech.net uh, uh, or through either of the two uh, meetup groups uh, for this event. Um, this talk and the presentation will be up early next week on the Greenfield Tech website and on the Peerless website, uh, including the slides. Any questions? Yes. Uh, let's talk about the vulnerability of uh, voice uh, uh, mailbox. Yes, voice box uh, on, on, on my PDFs. Now, uh, is uh, my cellular voicemail also vulnerable in this sense? Like, if I keep uh, uh, the default password on my cell phone, uh, uh, can it be uh, used for something worse than uh, listening to the voice messages? Worse, worse than the Daily Mail. Uh... Diana incident that happened a couple years ago where they were listening to voicemails and other things. Um, it depends on the, on the cellular provider. Okay, If it allows you to do call forwarding um, through the voicemail configuration, then yes. It's the same problem as a desk PDX. It depends on the individual, how the cell, cellular providers have configured their switches. So this is something you need to look at if it has an option of a way message or call forwarding to another location. Um, That's not the only way uh, to handle this. Um, most of the voice Louder. most of the voicemail systems, um, when you leave a message, then my voicemail system says, "Hey, you've got a message from," and then it reads out the number. Uh, 
-huh. And most systems let you uh, press 9 to call right. the, call back. Right. the one who will leave the message. Okay. And that's, this way yeah. 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 Oh, this is this, this is the original yeah. vulnerability. Yeah. No, but the, the top, at the end, it, would you like to call someone? Would you like to roll this number back? Is an option. It's a built-in feature. So it's, oh. it's not really decent. I see. So uh, somebody calls me from Cuba. Yeah. Uh, uh, somebody uh, else has hacked your mailbox, and they can then tell it to recall the number. And they recall can the recall number. the number and get uh, times. hundreds of dollars. Uh, yeah. Of call. Okay. So yes. Uh, this is why I'm saying you, your cell phone is effectively a mini PBX, partially uh, in right. the phone, partially well, in the this carrier. Works, this works with the cell phone. Yeah. yeah. The so other well. thing is you have the ability to configure every cell phone to do an automatic call forward. So if you dial the code, if you dial the right codes, which is also usually through the same menu structure as your um, voicemail password, allows you to call forward the calls so they never even show up on the phone, they get redirected at the switch level. Okay, which would be the exact same thing. Um, so there are a lot of places where there are vulnerabilities in the armor here, and if you're not careful, you are leaving yourself open to it. So yes. So again, zero 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 one 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 four four four. One are the two, last four, four digits of your of your phone one, number. One two three four five. One two, one, two three, three four. four. Yeah. Uh, that's less as a default one, but yes, it's a common one. And the last four digits of the phone number are all ones you should be preventing. So orange will give you uh, four 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 four. Cellcom I think does all zeros as the default passwords. Um, nobody in Israel that I know of does one two three four anymore. Cellcom does. Did I don't know if they still do. Did and well for for their. Uh, 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 it should be said that if you. S Leave this uh, number uh, de default. You cannot uh, call uh, your uh, voicemail uh, from another device, or at least uh, not, no. not, 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 not easily. Uh, this would be a very nice policy. I don't know. They have, they have this policy in, okay. in cell phone. Uh, no, the, 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 I, I, I know. I tried. <laughs> okay. This, so, this is a, a big improvement over when I worked in Telcom. If you, uh, they, 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 they actually say you must change your default number uh, password, otherwise you will not be able to get to your voicemail from uh, a an different outside number. device. Okay. Uh, from an outside number, right? So that makes sense because Cellcom has been hit with a number of fraud cases that I know, or Cellcom customers have been gone to court on a number of cases that I know of. Uh -huh. Um, so yeah, it's nice to see that they started implementing policy. But keep in mind, HOT lets you put a voice, a voice phone, a standard telephone, plugged into uh, the ATA built into the HOT box. Okay, Bezik Ben Lumi, all of these guys who will give you a standard Bezik router for your DSL, have a port where you can plug in a regular phone, not counting you can plug a, a voice over IP phone into any Ethernet port. Okay. So you have to be careful because all of these run with the same category of problem. And to be honest, most people are really lax on their security on their home uh, systems. Kill, kill, the, kill the video.